Hello and welcome to the podcast. You're here with Physique Development and today we're going to continue right along with our new myth busting series. In today's episode, we're going to give you our thoughts on the topic of muscle damage. Most notably, we're going to answer the question, is muscle damage the best for muscle growth? Or asked in a different way, is muscle damage something you should seek out if your goal is building muscle? So right off the bat here, I wanted to sort of hand it off uh, to Sue and Alex to, to tell some stories. I'm going to include mine as well. But Sue, do you remember your first training session that you experienced really painful muscle soreness, like debilitating muscle soreness? Yeah, I was trying to think on this and I was thinking back and I couldn't remember like the exact situation with the exercise, but true like muscle soreness in the way that you're supposed to feel it, so to speak, was actually when I first started training with Alex because outside of that, a lot of my soreness or just feeling like obliterated after a session wasn't really like, oh, I feel like it was just like in the muscle and I got great my muscle connection. It was more of like, yeah, I'm like tired from my session and that hurt. But it was some of our first sessions uh, with Alex and I just re remember learning how to truly contract my musculature and being like, holy crap, and being so sore the next day and not really understanding why I was that sore. Because I do remember it was a easier on paper workout that I kind of looked at it and was like, eh, it's not going to be that much. And then we really got into it. And I was like, oh my gosh, how did four exercises just completely bottom me out? Yeah. I, I would say that almost all of the physique development programs are ones that on paper are going to look like, man, this doesn't seem like a whole lot. And then in application, it's something that we really destroy people with. So um, the first workout that I had excessive soreness with is uh, dating back to high school. And we had a week that was, was all about 10 sets of 10 on our primary movements. Um, so it was kind of like this hell week within football that our head coach at that time had a ton of, of love and passion for this week. Like he lived and died by having this week of time. And even our strength and conditioning coach, um, Josh, was not on board with this being like a good idea. Like he was like, this is stupid. Um, but I get that, uh, this like builds mental toughness and this kind of weeds out the, the soft kids, uh, from the team. And so we would do 10 by 10 on squats one day. And then we'd have that paired with like four sets of eight of lying leg curl. And that was the first time that I had like excessive muscle damage where I was like, oh my gosh. And I, I want to say that we still had like practice during that week as well. Like we were doing 10 sets of 10 in the squat rack, but we we were also going out and playing football in the same day. I, I don't remember if that's totally the case. Um, and then we'd go and do it. Was for it two a days? I, I want to say it was part of two days. Yeah, which even is is more insane. Um, Mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. And then we did it for I think bench press. I think it was maybe just those two days. We had the bench press ten by ten, and then we had the back squat ten by ten, and probably something within power cleans another day or something along those lines. But that was like the first time that I was like, or I can remember at least that I was like, oh my gosh, this is, my body is not functioning. Like I cannot contract my quad. I cannot contract my glutes. This is excessive muscle damage, potentially muscle wasting at, at that point, because I'm sure that there was no way that I was getting in sufficient calories to actually recover from that multitude of work. So, um, that was a, an experience in and of itself. Yeah. We all wasted away. I think during that time, <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of, a lot of protein degradation, a lot of atrophy rather than hypertrophy um happening there a lot of a lot of mental hypertrophy i think you know which is is to be understandable uh when you when you think about a sport but um yeah i, I think i've blocked out a lot of those years <laughs> in my head i just i don't remember much of that um and i, I think that's for mm -hmm. you know probably psychologically being protective more so than anything um but what i remember of my own was, uh, or my own my own training that elicited probably the worst muscle damage. There's definitely multiple memories that come to mind here, and one of those was when I was at um, well, one of those when I was actually first getting into training for like physique competitions. Uh, I, I remember I was this is before I had met Alex, uh, or not met Alex, but 
Alex and I became training partners and, and closer friends and stuff like that. And this was before, like leading into my first show ever. And I remember we did the, the German volume training, which is a 10 by 10, right? Made very, really popularized by, you know, Charles Poliquin, as far as I'm aware, at least within our world, right? And this 10 by 10 of course, you always go, you always start 10 by 10 with legs for some, for some reason, you just start this, like you start this program with legs and I, I've never understood that, but here we are. So 10 by 10 on squats. Right. And I do remember being, that was the first time I was sore. I think for like seven days straight, I was just debilitatingly sore for seven days straight. And then, um, I vowed I was never going to do that again. Uh, which was a lie. Um, I definitely did it again. Uh, and then the second memory that's very, um, very hard to forget was I got a session in um, with BPAC way back in the day, obviously here. Um, but I got a session in with BPAC and I remember we went from, we went from hack squats, but like sissy squat type hack squats into all, all to failure, into leg press to failure, into leg extension to failure, into a walking lunge <laughs> in which at this point, I got out of the, the leg extension. And if you've ever been to MI40 or seen like f videos or images or whatever, it's like the, the turf part, the track part. Um, and I remember, I was walking over to that track and I was, I was really questioning. You, you sort of have this like internal dialogue in your head where you're really questioning if you can even bend your knee to where you can support your body weight and, or it'll like buckle and you're going to fall, you know, like instantly. Um, and I remember, I remember, uh, Ben was like, Hey, all right. Walking lunges to finish this out. Walking lunges till you can't. I literally took one step, my leg buckled and I fell. <laughs> And he goes, all right, that's it. <laughs> and I was like, and then, and then three hours later, I got on a plane. Oh, um, oh, dude, this was treacherous. And then, so three hours later, I got on a plane and I, I swear to you, I think I was, I think I, I didn't train legs for at least two weeks after that. <laughs> I mean, I was probably sore for two weeks after that session. Uh, so th that's definitely my horror story. Um, any other, any other come to mind there? I, I will say that after Austin came back from his internship at MI40, he was very excited to show me everything that he learned from MI40, oh, those type sure. of sessions yeah. right away. So I was like <laughs> yeah. thrown into the deep end of this, I mean, completely diabolical program design uh, with Austin right away. He was like, you have to try these things out. They were terrible. And I was like, yes, they were horrible. <laughs> you were <laughs> And now right. he takes those diabolical <laughs> things yeah. and he uses them on me as a test <laughs> subject. He'll be like, how's that volume? And I'll be like, I literally couldn't walk. He'll be like, ah, whatever. You, you were fine. Just keep pushing. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so now, Alex, you're sympathetic to where I was at. You're like, dude, I got to put this on somebody else. Like yeah, somebody else has, has to, to experience, experience this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone's got to experience this. All right. So stories out of the way there, um, kind of introduce you guys. I'm sure, you know, if you're listening and you have some sort of, uh, story that relates, if you guys are watching on YouTube, put it in the comment section. If you guys have a story or a, a time you can remember, put it in the comment section. We'd love to read it. We'd love to comment on it. Um, because those type of stories I think are, ones that sort of indoctrinate you into this world of like really hard training. And I think everyone who has been in the gym at, to some extent understands that level of muscle, muscle damage that, that happens during a session, especially when you come out of the gates really hot um, and you haven't maybe trained or, or something like that. So yeah, if you guys have stories, put them in the comment section. We'd love, love to read them. I know the diabolical side of myself would love to to read about that <laughs> and uh, just kind of get a laugh out of it. So um, do share those stories. So let's kind of start out here by defining what muscle damage is, right? So we can kind of get a definition down, some understanding of, of the language we're going to be using today and kind of more specifically what we're actually talking about. Because um, I, I know in the beginning part of this, we've kind of interchanged muscle damage with muscle soreness. So I want to kind of clear up any any 
main confusions that may be there. Okay, so muscle damage occurs when intense exercise or stress is placed on unaccustomed or detrained muscle tissue. Okay, more specifically, this is observed as exercise induced muscle damage. And I want to specify exercise induced because muscle damage can also occur from disease like inflammatory myopathies and things like that, some inflammatory diseases, but also blunt force trauma to the muscle tissue, right? So a car crash, car wreck, um, or getting hit in your quad by a baseball bat. <laughs> I found that very um, funny, I'm, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Um, you know, and I was I was thinking of an example. I'm like, you know, getting hit by in your quad by a baseball bat, like by Mike Trout or Albert Pujols. But honestly, an eight-year-old could do plenty of damage. Yeah. So really just getting hit at all by anything can add that blunt force trauma to, to that area, right? And that's that muscle is going to be sore, but just because a muscle is sore, did it grow, right? That's kind of what we're going to talk about today uh, in a roundabout way and kind of define some things and, and kind of go into that world of, okay, do we need muscle damage to get ourselves closer and closer to our goal of muscle growth? Okay, so the most common symptoms, which you guys are definitely going to recognize of this exercise-induced muscle damage are going to be decreased strength and power, increased muscle stiffness and swelling, and delayed onset muscle soreness, those DOMS, right, that we talked about uh, in the opening stories where, you know, we have these delayed onset muscle soreness, these DOMS for seven days, 14 days. And it's like in your head, one, you've probably experienced this to some degree, but also in your head, it's like, do you think that was productive being sore for 14 days? Like sore to the touch. Like I've been so sore. Like I remember I also had this squat session where we tried out incomplete rest method with squats and then did a full workout after that too. And I was to the point where like my wife looked at my legs and I was like, don't look at my legs. <laughs> like, don't even look at them. Cause I was like, I, I feel like you're going to do that thing where you try to tickle my knee or something like right above the knee where you kind of like someone grabs above your knee and tries to like tickle you a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I will cry if you do that. Like, do not, do not touch me. Do not look at my legs. Um, and so I'm sure we've all experienced that, right? That decreased strength and power, increased muscle stiffness and swelling in those DOMs that just last, right? Which impede our ability to do productive work, right? Towards our goal of progressive overload, leading ourselves closer and closer to muscle growth and all the things that come with that, right? So exercise-induced muscle damage does exist on a continuum. And I, I think that's really important to mention because it's, it's something that spans from a mild which can be potentially helpful or at least a signal towards, hey, this is productive to some degree, to severe, right? Which can cause large amounts of tissue disruption and a lot of negative downstream effects uh, systemically, right? Which ultimately have no positive effects on muscle growth, which we can pull out, you know, literature from the Schoenfelds of the industry, uh, guys like Chris Beardsley, all of these guys that do this, um, this research in the industry and they're, they're going to tell you, hey, muscle damage is there. We understand it's there. It's a byproduct, but we're not sure how productive it is, even still to this day, right? It is summertime. And with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. So what causes this? And as again, as you can start to sort of reverse engineer some of these stories, these things that cause this excessive amount of muscle damage, which goes into the severe category and goes into the not as productive category of muscle damage is often by high training volumes and more exaggerated eccentric contractions, right? Or mainly using eccentrically loaded or dominant or biased exercises. And so if you guys were lifting um, at the beginning of the pandemic and maybe you only had a squat, I know these guys could probably lend a hand to this story if you guys are like lifting at the beginning of the pandemic you got a squat rack you had you had some barbell you had a barbell and some weight and all of your workouts were eccentrically loaded like with squats and lunges and all of those things 
you probably found yourself and you were excited because you're like, oh my God, I get to lift again. So I'm going to do a ton of volume <laughs> with all of these eccentrically dominant movements. And I am super sore. So <laughs> do you got anything to add there or any experience to add there that you guys can remember? Yeah, I think that um, I was in the camp of I was very excited that we had finally gotten equipment because at the beginning of the pandemic, we were sneaking into a college um, training facility that was about 45 minutes from our house that we were traveling to every day. So it was like a four hour excursion every day. So the fact that we did not have to do that any longer and could just train with the barbell in the garage was a uh, godsend. And so within that, I was, like I said, very excited and I was squatting almost every day. Cause I was just like, I just can't believe that I have this in my own home now. And like Austin said, I was very, very sore. And this is another thing within our clients who train from home and maybe they only have dumbbells and they only have barbells. And when we write the training, um, for them, they see that the volume is significantly lower than what they would potentially see, um, within, uh, like in gym training where we have more concentric loading and more machines to utilize and those different things. And this is something where we have to really educate of the trauma that is being, or, or the, um, the tension that's being placed on the tissue is is different when we're only loading from that eccentric uh, portion. And so, um, yeah, there's a, a lot of experiences on that front where you just have to back things off from a volume perspective and, and really allow for us to get greater quality per set rather than looking at this quantity of, of total sets. I will note that when we first got the squat rack, there would be times where like uh, it was in our garage and my office was right above it. And I would hear him in the middle of the day, like grunting because he was lifting. And I'd be like, is he lifting right now? And then I'd kind of hear the door. And then like an hour later, I'd hear the grunting again. I'm like, what is going on? And I asked him one day and he was like, oh, just like when I need to get up from my computer, I'll just go do a set of squats and then come back in. <laughs> He's like, I just leave it loaded in there. I just go do a set and come back in. And I'm like, I mean, I think that sounds like not a great idea, but, you know, to yeah. each their own right this second. It's a very accurate representation of my personality. I get very excited about things and I want to burn them out as soon as possible because <laughs> yeah. I get so excited. I do the same thing with music. Like I, if I find a song. Oh, let's say songs, yeah, songs sayings, mm -hmm. words. I will. I will uh, yeah. <laughs> words, words. Very much so. Sayings. Yeah. Words. Um, songs. I will find a song that I love and then sing it chronically until Sue's ears start to bleed. One, and now because, my gals too. <laughs> One, because I can't sing at all. And two, because it's just very repetitive of just like basically the chorus. I, I don't really learn. It's like one line of a song. <laughs> and yesterday I just and to this myself morning, all day. he's just been singing the same one. And then Miguel will like join in. And yeah. I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh my gosh. Now, the main difference between Miguel and I is that Miguel can actually sing. So it sounds better. And then, and then it just continues to, you know keep the roller coaster going because he actually keeps everyone's ears from not bleeding, which is nice. The yin and the yang. Yeah, exactly. Obsessive behavior. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm glad you guys sort of took that over because I was in that driver's seat for a while, Sue. So I'm, I'm very <laughs> glad that you took the reins there and you can just, you can take that over. Um, <laughs> so a, a common misnomer here is that this exercise induced muscle damage, right? That leads to this, this cascade of, of being really, really sore, especially if this is excessive, um, is the misnomer here is that this is better, right? This is something, and this is kind of the, you know, the myth that we're trying to bust here more or less is that more is always better, right? And we've talked about that a lot on this podcast. We talk a lot, it, we talked a lot about it on the program design series about training volumes and training intensity and all of those things where, Hey, more is probably not better here, right? Better is better. And what's better for you is different than what's better for someone else, right? And even so people who have trained together for a long time, even now to this day, <clears throat> you know, I, I can most uh, make the closest comparison to Alex and I um, with our training history. And I train with a different volume now. So Alex and I used to train with the same volume, always, didn't matter. Um, but now, it's, and that was very productive, right? Uh, but even at that time, we probably could have gotten away with training a little differently. Um, it's been maybe even more productive for ourselves, but that's beside the point. Um, but now it's like, I know if I show up to, you know, 
the Bush home gym here. I and I get put through a session that Alex is doing. I'm probably going to need <laughs> half the sets, you know, yeah. to, to really get what I need from that. And that's more of like I'm here. I'm trying to catch back up to Alex because um, I think he's surpassed me in this these categories. But I've refused to come to that realization. So um, more recently, I've tweaked my back because I, I was trying to probably rush squats a little bit too fast in terms of my my load selection. So, hey. Um, here we are with that, but that's the common thing that we're trying to essentially debunk before we get too off, off track there is that more is always better, right? So more, more soreness leads to more growth, which is not necessarily the case, right? So all there, there is some positive feedback to this muscle soreness, right? And this is something that I really try to convey in, in my book where it was like, I wanted to touch on muscle damage and, and muscle soreness to a degree where I didn't want to write it off because I definitely am in the camp and I'd love to hear from you guys too. And I, I think we all kind of share this. I'm definitely in the camp of some is fine. Some is good. And especially in certain contexts, I'm actually sort of looking for it to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and to me, this is like a sign that you've placed large amounts of tension on the target tissue, for example, right? And if you've done that productively, and especially if it's at the front end of a phase or when maybe you're transitioning exercises, it's like, okay, that's productive. But let's say you've been doing the same exercises for a while, or you're transitioning, you're like, you know what? I'm just gonna double my training volume. That seems like a great idea. That type of debilitating soreness probably isn't that productive, right? So. The context is very important here. And, and so I wanted to open up the floor again, uh, now that we sort of have all that stuff in our minds, fresh in our minds. I wanted to uh, ask Alex a question here. Um, is muscle damage something you're considering when writing a training program, whether for yourself or clients or, or even Sue here? <laughs> yeah, I think that it is going to be something that I'm considering because I think that the when I'm looking at maximizing hypertrophy, and we're going to have many other factors that go into it outside of just the the training structure, the volume that's there. There, I mean, it's a big part of it, but there's going to be other factors that we uh, focus on within nutrition and sleep and recovery and all those things. And when we look at muscular damage, we want to essentially get as much as or, or muscular damage, uh, mechanical tension, those different factors. We want to get as much as we can we can get with also having the recovery. And so what we don't want to see is an individual that is going to have, let's say where that we're training 20 sets, for example, of glutes, and we could have all of that in one singular session. Are we going to get the, the best overall workload? Are we going to have the best load being utilized? Those different factors. Or are we going to create so much muscular damage that maybe we are... Um, putting us at a greater risk of injury or, or something along those lines where maybe we split it up into two sessions and have 10 sets where we get a lot of work out of it and have really great execution as well as load being utilized. And then on Wednesday or Thursday, let's say Thursday, we'll go with Thursday. Thursday, we have another 10 sets and we've actually recovered from those 10 sets on Monday to where we're building off of that session going into the next session and we're having incremental improvements, whether that be from a, a load selection standpoint point execution, um, all those different factors. So we want to have enough muscle damage that is going to be um, something that we can recover from because we don't want to just basically get back to the baseline. We don't want to utilize all of our recovery uh, nutrients and, and resources to just get back to the baseline. We want to get past the baseline and then just continuing to elevate and, and improve our overall strength, our execution, all those different factors. So muscular damage is going to be an important piece, but it's going to be a balancing act of, is it too little? Is it too much? We want to be right in the middle. And that is going to come with experience as well as understanding what the client can handle from a load selection standpoint, um, exercise and, and or exercise selection, volume selection, all those things. So there's a lot of different components that go into creating a program um, that are going to be very pivotal. And the more that you more time that you have for the person, you're going to be able to articulate this better and get better results. So 
the more time that you spend with your coach, the more time that you allow for them to get data collection, the better results that you're going to have. So stick with your coach. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, really taking, I mean, as you guys have said, taking context into consideration and then taking your recovery into consideration. Because when we look at anything. I mean, Alex said it in the last podcast of you grow from what you can recover from. And we often say here at PD, you want to train hard and recover harder. Because if you don't have that recovery aspect, then everything you've just worked and put yourself through is null and void. And maybe it's not even void, but it's putting you in a deficit of recovery. And that's really hard to get out of when it comes to recovery. If you have like a sleep deficit, or if you have a, a food deficit, or you have that damage deficit, that's really hard to come back from instead of being able to tailor, okay, what is in place and what is going to allow this person to be successful. So when we also look at damage, if we say more isn't always better, that's 100% correct, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have its place. We want to be able to look at, okay, maybe within this exact program, we don't want to have excessive damage. But if we look at this over time, as we go through different programs, we can accumulate that damage in different ways, and it can help us with the different goals that we have in place. So if you haven't listened to our Training 101 series that starts at episode 47, when you're listening to this podcast. So go on back if you haven't listened to it or if you need a little bit of a refresher um, to learn some of these terms and some of these um, some of these variables that you want to take into consideration when you are building out a training program for someone. So when we look at frequency, this is a big thing too of <clears throat> you know how often are we are we training these muscle groups throughout the week, right? And Alex mentioned that where, you know, he gave the example of training glutes, you know, 20 sets across a week. Which is a lot. I wouldn't start there, FYI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably not start there. Uh, again, if you go kind of go back to that uh, episode 46, um, we go into, I forget what episode we started with in terms of the topic, but there's a training volume episode within that um, where we do talk about kind of where to where's a productive place to start with training volume and where's a productive place to sort of titrate that up or increase that uh, across the weeks. And so when we look at that, um, and I, I had a, a nice image pulled up from uh, Chris Beardsley. If you guys aren't familiar with Chris Beardsley, he's, uh, he's a great resource uh, within th these topics of, of strength training. He, he goes, a lot more into the weeds. We, we typically stay more on the surface of things, um, but he, he typically goes deep and deep into the weeds. But he posted a very helpful graphic uh, going over the first set in a workout that is performed has the greatest stimulating effect for hypertrophy, assuming you're going near or to failure. And that first set does have the most stimulating effect, right? And then, then the next two sets are also very effective for stimulating uh, hypertrophy while causing relatively low levels of muscle damage, it's, again, assuming kind of we're going closer to failure. And then sets four and five provide smaller, sets six and seven provide even smaller. If you hit upwards of eight plus sets in that session, it's very, very low yield in terms of what you're getting benefit, cost benefit to hypertrophy to muscle damage, right? So the more sets we're doing over time, that's leading us closer and closer to getting less and less of what we want from a hypertrophy standpoint, and we're getting more and more of that muscle damage, right? So we're trying to find within a volume allocation across the week, we're really trying to separate that in a way where we can maximize our ability to drive hypertrophy in those uh, downstream effects that cause hypertrophy and trying to limit the amount of muscle damage that we get across that week, right? Because we can slowly, as our body adapts, we can slowly work that up over the weeks, right? Weeks, months, years, uh, if you look at it on a larger time scale. If you're listening to this right now and you're like, dang, this sounds freaking great. I would love to be able to add muscle to my frame, but I need help doing it. Go ahead and look at the link in the description box or in the show notes, and we'd love to hop on a call with you and be the last coach that you'll ever need. 
All right, so starting with Sue here, do you have times when you seek out muscle damage or muscle soreness uh, within your training uh, more specifically? Yes, I do. And again, this is looking at just what we talked about of that bigger picture of what the goal is and what we're trying to accomplish. Because outside of just tension on the muscle, there's going to be different things that happen at the cellular level that can be really positive when you do have that muscular damage as a whole. So being able to look at things like satellite cell recruitment, as well as looking at lysosome um, at biogenesis and being able to see those benefits that really help potentiate what you can accomplish in future hypertrophy phases. Now, this doesn't mean that it's immediately going to cause you to have more strength and bigger muscles, but it is going to give you a potential to do that within your cells. So that is going to be a really positive thing that we are looking for as a whole when we are building out training programs is what is our end goal? What is the total volume that we have in place? What can this person recover from? And then being able to see, all right, what things in place are going to help us with having this muscle damage to see that. Look at Sue giving you guys some uh, very nerdy terms. There. That's good. It's in depth Thank physiology. I know, a little here, bit of yeah. physiology, just giving people the, the sauce there. Um, Lost in the sauce. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it, it's going to be dependent on where it falls within the training. What does the individual have going on at the time in terms of when we're looking at someone within contest prep? I'm not going to be driving up a whole lot of muscular damage as we get closer and closer to the show. Reason being is that, one, we're, we're looking at uh, photos to assess progress and we're wanting to look a, a certain way to have a certain level of, of body fat leanness and those different factors. And so if I'm creating a ton of muscular damage, causing a lot of inflammation and soreness and those different things, it's not going to help a whole lot to the greater goal that we have in place there. Now, if that same individual is in their improvement season and they are um, eating extremely well, we're not having a whole lot, of, we don't have a photo shoot coming up or anything of that nature, and we're wanting to grow, and this is going to potentiate the possibility ability of, of adding more tissue or having a greater work capacity moving forward within whatever the exercise is or whatever muscle groups being trained, then that's a good time to do it. And so it's going to come at a, a certain time and a certain place and, and all the parameters around it are going to need to be in the right position for it to be successful. Because if you were to drive up muscular damage in a caloric deficit and um, not have the recovery um, components in place, you're not going to get a whole lot out of it. And another time that it may be advantageous is if you're at the end of a, a mesocycle and you're a, a on the horizon of a deload, it would be a good time to drive up the muscular damage because it is something that you're going to have an extended period of time to recover from that um, within your training. Yeah. I, and I wanted to ask a follow-up to that. And I think this, this follow-up question does <clears throat> also lend a hand of teaching people how to potentially avoid muscle damage if they're not seeking it. So uh, what are some tactics for ensuring muscle damage does happen? Alex, if you have anything top of mind, if you're, if you're looking for like in a, in a client's training program, let's say, right. When you're writing it out, you're like, nope, this is definitely gonna cr generate some muscle damage. What are you, what are you putting in there? To Yeah. So within that, there's a couple of different ways. I think that a very valuable tool to create muscular damage is going to be supersets. Same muscle supersets is going to be a really valuable tool. And so targeting the tissue where it's going to be the, the strongest, for example, um, to start the superset. So let's think about maybe a... Um, like a back squat for quads and then going into a leg extension. So if I was to really tax out the quads within the back squat and then go into the leg extension, that's going to be something that's going to elicit over multiple sets, a, a greater deal of muscular damage, something that's going to really drive up oxidative stress and muscular damage is going to be something along the lines of maybe we start with a leg extension we go into the back squat and then we come back to the leg extension for like, it could be a set of six for the leg extension, a set of six on the back squat, and then finish off with another set on the leg extension for like 15. I can assure you two sets there, you will be done. The The damage is done on those quads. You will not need to do any other quad exercises that day. Can so confirm. <laughs> there are, I, the easiest way to really make it happen is going to be same muscle group supersets or something crazy like that tricep. 
Yeah, and some other things that are going to cause that muscle damage is when we're looking at how many sets to failure are in place. Um, Alex mentioned supersets, and he talked about like a lengthened to shortened or shortened to lengthened. But doing like a lengthened to lengthened superset can really get you some muscle damage going. Uh, also, being able to look at if someone has like drop sets or cluster sets that can cause some more muscle damage again, depending on the amount or frequency that are in place. Depending depending on how much rest you have. So if you have a very short amount of rest and you're going back to back on things, that can definitely cause some muscle damage. Um, and I feel like there's a, a few more, just, I mean, long eccentrics, as we mentioned to begin with. Yeah, I think that the the eccentric loading um, and the the total volume per session, I think, can't be overlooked. And and I think that especially like in um, times previous, and, and, and athletes really uh, fall into this category where within your your training for your sport, oftentimes it's like the more that you can do, the better off that you're going to be. And they oftentimes take that uh, thought process and put that into their resistance training after their time that they're playing the the sport itself. And within uh, resistance training, it's going to, you can't do too little, but you also don't want to be do too much because once we get in that too much category, which we're kind of talking about today within the damage component is that we're getting diminishing returns or lack thereof of returns. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going into the gym, I want to maximize and optimize my results within hypertrophy. If I'm not going to be getting the results and I would be getting the same same results by just um, you know hanging out watching movies on the couch then I would rather sit on the couch and watch movies than just go in the gym and spend two hours and beat myself up to get nothing out of it type situation now that you're getting nothing but you're not getting the optimal it, results necessarily yeah the desired goal yeah um, another one I thought of that uh, just adding pauses in those high tension areas or in those lengthened positions is also going to cause some more damage there yeah so recapping there um <laughs> there's so much yeah just recapping that a little bit um we, we're looking at training volume is a big one um how we're loading that training volume so if it's it's really biased towards eccentric loading so eccentric loading would be the lowering portion of like a back squat for example that's an eccentric uh rep or load or loading on the muscle and that muscle is also lengthened when the tension is greatest so that's kind of uh, a twofer and then also um shorter rest times within all of that right so training volume as a whole how you're loading that training volume and the rest you're taking between sets of said training volume and loading right so all of those things come into play and so if you're like man this sounds way too difficult i don't know what you guys are talking about anything beyond the normal i go in I do four sets of eight on bench press. I rest for two to three minutes in between sets. I feel good. I'm not that sore or I may be a little sore, whatever from that session. Anything beyond that. So anything more advanced, anything in addition to anything manipulating any one of those variables are going to start to trend you more towards more muscle damage potential, right? And the, the intimate nature of program design and what we do as coaches, especially what we really pay attention to at Physique Development with our clients, is finding that intimate balance between where do you want to be as a client? What are your goals? What's your training age? What's your skill level? What are you going into the gym to feel? And, and what do you want to feel when you come out of the gym? And we try to facilitate that with an appropriate amount of training volume, with an appropriate amount of rest, with an appropriate amount of all of these factors, right? Over time, because that's the balancing act that we play as coaches of, okay, here's, we're gonna push you, but not so much that we can't recover from it, or not so much that there's too much damage to head into and, and perform well into a subsequent session after that. right? Right. So we're always playing with that intimate balance of program design. And I, I think that's, we can go, we could talk about program design for hours, <laughs> of course. Um, but I, I really do think that's such a big part of the m matching the expectation with the reward of weight lifting, weight training, strength training, whatever you want to call it is what you're doing when you go into the gym 
matters and does it match what you want from that activity, right? Because if you're a person that just wants to recreationally lift and you want to go in, you want to, you want to train hard, but you don't want to be, you got life to worry about. You got multiple kids, you got shit to do. Like you don't want to be crippling sore of like, Hey, I got to be able to go up and down the stairs without, you know, without missing a beat. It's like, all right, well, we're probably not going to just trash your quads or your glutes, right? To an extent where you're so sore that you can't just like do your normal life, right? But also we have clients that come in and they're like, hey, I want to be trashed. I want to not be able to walk the next day because they can also recover from right. it to an mm-hmm. appropriate level, right? And so it's like, okay, let's have some fun, right? So both of those are fun, but they're fun for different people, different personality types, different goals, right? Yeah. And I, one thing I will add is that you're not going to get huge off of one training session. So when you are looking at your training or the amount of muscular uh, damage that you're wanting to create, understand that getting huge or, or adding muscle tissue or creating the greatest degree of hypertrophy is going to come over multiple sessions. The individual who's able to hit that threshold of like a, a three RIR or, or less over a consistent basis, time after time, month after month, session after session, is going to have a greater hypertrophy benefit than the individual, what we've learned from research, than the individual who is going to have one session that completely demolishes them. They go balls to the wall. Um, RIR is zero. They try to max out, fail every single set and aren't able to retrain that tissue for another 14 days. Or maybe they get to a seven days later and they're still not recovered from that first session. So they're really not getting much at all from a, a benefit or hypertrophy standpoint. So understand that we have to fall into this middle ground of, of threshold of we have to have intensity, not too much, not too little to allow for us to have the greatest hypertrophy benefit. Yeah. And I think an important note on that is we have clients that will say like, I love doing hypertrophy or I love doing neuro training and I don't want to do this other type of training. And I get it. You can have a favorite, but understand that they all work synergistically together to get you to the goal that you want to get to. And you have to be able to interchange those so that you can get the desired result and you can see the progress that you want over that time frame that Alex is talking about. And since we have talked about soreness here and kind of used it somewhat interchangeably when it comes to muscle damage. I do want to make a little statement here of soreness doesn't mean that you did have muscle damage and that soreness can often be an inflammatory response. And like Austin said, you can get hit in the quad with a bat and still have muscle soreness. And that doesn't mean that you're growing from it. So you don't need to equate, oh, I wasn't sore, so I didn't have muscle damage or I was sore, so I did have muscle damage because you can be not sore and still have muscle damage, whether you are on the lower end of the spectrum of seeing that muscle damage or you were just able to recover from it because your recovery is in such a positive spot. Because when we look at training, acute inflammation is great and we want to have inflammation in place. And we do try to make um, and known to our clients of like, don't try to get rid of inflammation immediately after training. We need that. It's an important part of the healing process in the recovery process. So don't go in and down turmeric and fish oil and anything else to just have anti-inflammatory pathways running because we want that inflammatory. We want to be, or that inflammation, we want to be able to heal from it. And then we want to be able to, again, have that recover that recovery be a priority. And when we look at recovery, again, we've said it a few different times, but just to say it one more time, because it is important. It's not just, all right, this training was too much so that uh, that's why I couldn't recover from it. Your recovery is not just like your training and the amount that's in place. It's looking at your sleep quality and quantity, your water intake, your food intake. If you can match your food to your training or even eating in a way that is going to serve your training, really looking at uh, your sleep, if I didn't already say that one. But if I did, it's important double to really prioritize your sleep. And then looking at, again, what your other aspects are in your day that are going to contribute to your recovery as a whole. So being able to look at that, especially if you're a coach listening to this and you have a client that is sore and you're like, I really don't think they should be sore from this session. And you've maybe undulated it a little bit. Look at those other factors that could be inhibiting them to be able to perform that session as a whole. And to expand on the inflammatory response, 
why that's necessary after the training is it's it's signaling to the body of like hey we've got we've got things that need repaired over here we need more nutrients we need more resources so please send it our way and if you're going to be utilizing anti-inflammatories following the training session you could blunt that signaling and so it could hinder your recovery process now the amount of of hindrance uh, that that can cause is is still being worked out from a research standpoint but we do understand that it is going to blunt that whole process so we want to be mindful of that within our supplementation and, and what we're consuming post-training. Yeah, great points by you both. And back to, so when Alex mentioned as well, it's like it's one training session, balls to the wall, like giving everything you got, leaving yourself crippling sore, isn't going to lead you towards that goal that you necessarily want from a muscle growth perspective, right? And there's a lot of ways we can sort of look at this, but the first one, right? So this is supported within research as well, right? So there is a, there's a very elevated response of muscle protein synthesis after one of these sessions where you're, you're eliciting a ton of muscle damage. There's a ton of inflammation, right? There's a, there's a high response of muscle protein synthesis, but what they have found is that is more related to you getting back to baseline, right? It is a high response from an MPS standpoint, a muscle protein synthesis standpoint, but it's really essentially getting you back to baseline. Right, so if you're always doing something just to get back to baseline, how do you improve over time? You know, because you're just gonna stay at the baseline. So you're gonna train super hard, you're gonna be debilitatingly sore, and you're not really gonna go anywhere, at least at the rate that you could, right? And so that's an important point. And, it, and if you, if this sort of abstract way of, of considering uh, strength training as we're talking about like these thresholds and, and these uh, like session uh, links or, or the intensity of a session or something like that. Imagine going for a run, right? So if you were to prepare for a marathon, you before the marathon, you wouldn't go out and run 26 miles on your first go and be like, all right, I'm in great shape. I'm ready to run, right? It's like, dude, start with a mile, recover from that maybe do a mile and a half, maybe increase the intensity or speed at which you do that mile and a half. And then maybe the next week you start to do two or three miles, right? You, you, that's how you would probably start to run. You wouldn't go out and run 26 miles off the bat and be like, man, I feel phenomenal. <laughs> I'm not sore at all. And this is great. I'm ready to run. I feel like I'm recovered, right? Said no one probably ever, ever yeah. outside of like Olympic athletes, right? Now you might need to have a whole bowl of fettuccine Alfredo right before the race <laughs> so that you're able to really carb load and get the best results. But that's just a pro tip from Michael Scott. That's only if you have rabies. Um, and the fear of water. <laughs> and the fear of water. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Please support um, the cure of rabies <laughs> that already exists. Um, so- to wrap, uh, essentially to wrap up today's episode, I, I wanted to really go into, um, and I, I have us essentially go into some takeaways, right? Where muscle damage is probably most appropriate and expected. And when something is too much, right? And something is over what is appropriate. Okay. So when is muscle damage most expected? Like when as a coach, like on our end, we're like, okay, there's probably going to be some muscle damage here, although we're being careful within the way that we're programming. Or let's say you you um you downloaded a program from on you know on the, the internet or whatever, and you haven't really been training that much. Or if you signed up for the PD app. Hey, if you signed <laughs> up for the PD app and you're like, hey, I haven't been training at all. <laughs> I'm just gonna go balls to the wall. And it's like, Okay, what well, we can expect some muscle soreness there, right? So when it's most expected, I'm kind of just going to run through a list um, and you see if you can relate to any of these, right? So folks that are, are, are people that are newer to strength training will experience more muscle damage, right? So there's, there's physiological uh, sort of phenomenons and, and protective mechanisms that go on that the more repeated exposure we have to said thing, that's caused the muscle damage, the less and less we're gonna get over time because our body's like, hey, I remember this from last time, that was miserable, let's not do that again. So I'm gonna have some protective mechanisms in place to 
protect us from that because you seem insane. So <laughs> our muscles sort of try to protect us uh, on that front. But so, so people that are newer to strength training will experience more muscle damage. New or novel exercises in your training program will increase your likelihood of muscle damage, right? So we talk a lot about, you know, if you want to go back to our exercise selection episode in the program design 101 series, um, that is an important one too, where you, you may see a lot on, you know, spread throughout the internet of like changing exercises up every week probably isn't a great idea, right? And there's a lot to that, but also there's the, there's going to consistently be the factor of, well, each time you do that, you're going to be increasingly more sore from that, meaning you can't do as much volume on that, meaning you can't progress that at the same rate as the other lifts you were doing and so on and so on and so on, right? And so that's like when we say, hey, we should probably just choose some exercises we really do well with and let's stick with them for two, three, four, five, six months, right? Maybe we're going to change up kind of the reps that we're doing or the rest periods we have or whatever, but like we're going to stick to a, the same like bulk. We may add some new ones in here or there, depending on what we're trying to elicit within the training. But as a whole, a lot of those primary lifts are going to stay consistent, right? Because we want that to stay consistent because our body is sort of gone through these processes on the front end of that. And now we're just working on progressing those things rather than starting over each time or each week, we're just starting over. It's like, okay, it's a new exercise. We got to go through all this again. This is going to limit how much volume we can do, how much we can progress it, so on and so on, right? When volume is too high for your ability to recover or your recoverability, right? That's a big one. So let's say you've been going, you've been, let's say you've even been doing these exercises for a while, but let's say this past week you did some travel, you had some big nights out on the town or whatever you're doing. Hey, when sleep is atrocious, all other factors are the same. Your ability to perform and recover from the same training volume will diminish. Right, so all of these factors are very, very important, right? So if you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, if you're super stressed, um, all of these factors are going to come into play when we're looking at the totality of volume that you can perform, perform well and progress, but also recover from, right? Which will really lend a hand to the muscle damage that does ensue. When rest periods are very short, in combination with high volume training. Again, the volume at which we're doing that thing, the exercises we're choosing to do that thing, and the rest periods between those things all matter, right? So the rest periods do matter. Um, and again, within physique development's programming, our programming philosophy, we definitely play around with rest periods quite a bit, right? Depending on the goal that we're trying to uh, get to or, or the adaptation we're trying to pursue or push forward, there are times where we want three, four minute rest periods. There's also times where we want 30 second rest periods, right? And there's a point to that. And, you know, we are explaining that to you when we're programming that for you. Uh, but not every program we write has, has three minute rest periods, right? So there's a time and a place for that. But understand if you have super high volume training with low rest, rest periods, there's a higher opportunity or an increased opportunity for muscle damage. And then when you train to or past failure, that's a huge one. Um, to failure too often or past failure too often, like partial reps, drop sets, you name it. I mean, that is just the recipe for the, that's just the recipe to increase the likelihood that you're going to get muscle damage but muscle damage to a severity that is unproductive, right? So we, again, as Alex mentioned earlier, being within two to three set or two to three reps shy of failure most consistently is probably the most productive place to be long-term. That doesn't mean we're not going to failure. We like failure here at Physique mm -hmm. Development. We like to push you. We like to push ourselves. We like to train really hard, but you have to know when to push and when to pull back on those. Anything to add to those uh, before I go into the next category here? No. Nope. Awesome. I'm on point so far. All right. When is it most appropriate to 
maybe seek out muscle damage or when, when are we looking for it to be appropriate within our program design? Okay. So when your goal is to drive higher amounts of training volume, like we talked about earlier, there are periods of time where we want to drive up training volume. We want to, to see a little bit of muscle damage as sort of proof in the pudding of, Hey, we're at a threshold that's just above our current level of adaptation. Good. We have a caloric surplus in place that can support that good. And if you're someone that's, and this is also to add to that before I move on to the next one, this at, this is an indicator that we have sufficient training volume. We have sufficient effort and we're placing su sufficient tension on the target muscle groups that we're trying to train. Right. And especially when you're supporting that with a, at least around maintenance, but calorically, but also if you can be in a surplus calorically, all of that is just going to support itself so much better, right? So if you're in a, if you're a competitor in an improvement season, or if you're just, just someone, a recreational lifter who loves to train, if you are driving training volume higher, if you're training with a lot of these advanced training techniques where you're doing drop sets and adding, you know, failure sets and partials and forced reps and all of these things, be sure you're in a position with your calories, with your sleep, with your stress, with the other things going on in your life to actually support those things, right? And sometimes you just need to go in and like demolish yourself for the sake of your own mental health. I get that. I do that plenty, <laughs> you know? But if we do that every session or long-term, is that the most appropriate for our goals that we wanna get done? Probably not, okay? Something to keep in mind. And then PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, are there to help with recovery, right? And so in a, in a big way. So if you have PEDs in, a pl in place, you can tolerate more volume, shorter rest times, you have more recoverability to work with. So you, although you may still experience this muscle damage, your ability to recover from it is going to be greater, right? And that's just a part of the game there if you are choosing to uh, take that route. Right or use those um, assisters. Anything to add there uh, to to that section? I don't think so. I think that the the one thing that I did want to add in general was that the the greatest progress that I've seen in my own training has been um, shifting from the mindset of. I want to crawl out of the gym every day. Like I, I earned my my time in the gym and shifted from that mindset into train another day, live another day to, to train at, at a high intensity threshold. There's a, it's a give and a take. And I think that that was the, the inner athlete in me to just leave it all out there and come back the next day, leave it all out there again. And, uh, I think at, at times within your training, when maybe you don't really understand how to create tension or contract tissue properly, I think that there's greater value potentially in that from like a mental fortitude standpoint. And, and you can maybe handle a little bit more just because of the contractile tissue not really being targeted properly. But as you get better at the execution, as you get better at uh, or your strength improves and you can handle greater loads, I can assure you that the uh, mentality of, of train another day or live another day is going to be much more beneficial to your hypertrophy rather than burying yourself every day and then like laying in bed and your body is still like throbbing and hot because you trained legs so heavily that day. Believe me, I've been there. The only reason I can recall that is because I can feel it in this moment. <laughs> I've lived that. So, you know, live another day. Yeah. And the last thing that I'll end before we wrap up this episode is if you train and then you really don't move throughout the rest of the day, that is really going to contribute to your soreness as a whole. So really make sure that you're still moving your body throughout the day. Even if you do go in and you train and you hit the session you're supposed to hit, you should still move your body, get some blood flow, and that's really going to help with overall soreness, which is going to help you to be more able to train as you move forward, plus the list of benefits that come from just moving your body as a whole, and especially if you're getting outside. But we'll go ahead and consider this myth. Busted. Boom. I got one of them to say it. <laughs> and we'll catch you in the next myth-busting episode.